as the I'm going to bring I'm closing down the room apparently with this talk. So this is going to be an unusual talk. Um, this is uh, due to a hard disk crash last night. I repaired it, so I'm going to give a new talk with old slides, and we'll see how that works. Um, and I've even changed the title in the spirit of that. And so I think what I really want you to think about as I go through the whole talk is that we're sort of in entering into this age of consequence. And when I'm when I say that, I mean something very specific. We, we're, we're getting better and better at measuring the consequence of our actions. And I think that has a number of sort of profound uh, sort of consequences. Um, so a lot of this work, you can have a look at whatson.com. Uh, it was a project to, to basically, through open source methods, measure the energy use of everything. Um, so we could, you know, th everyone after watching, you know, the Al Gore type show is, so what do I do? I wanted to answer that question in specific detail. And so Galileo's quote of measure what is measurable, make measurable what is not is sort of apropos, and you'll, you'll see that shortly. So you've all heard about this problem, climate change. You've all heard about carbon footprints. And you've definitely heard about energy independence. Um, and what I'm going to show you is a big pile of numbers, basically, that all of these are, in some respects, uh, are an aesthetic issue. And deeply, it's a what is quality life uh, and quality of life question. All right, so there's two stories I'm going to fly through. One is global, that is the, the real numbers on climate change and what the potential solutions are. And then one is extremely personal. And so I, uh, I started a wind energy company doing higher altitude wind power. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And in early stages of the company, we didn't want to tell the world exactly what we were doing, so I d but I still had to give public talks. So I, I thought, well, I'll use this as an opportunity to educate myself in energy more broadly. And it sort of started with this question, how much power do I use as an individual? How much energy? So as this is a tutorial session, um, the very basics of energy, so energy is measured in joules. Lifting an apple from the ground to this podium would use one joule of energy. Uh, power is measured in watts. It's the rate at which you use energy. Um, one watt is one joule per second, so lifting that apple once a second uh, uses a watt. If I was lifting 40 apples per second from the ground to the podium, that would be about 40 watts. And that would be about enough to run the laptop that's running this presentation. So that's to give you some intuition, because I'm going to talk a lot about watts in this talk. Here's roughly the scale of ma uh, orders of magnitude of power. So you sitting there are consuming 100 watts in uh, biochemical energy. Your kettle, when it's boiling, is using about 1,000 watts or a kilowatt. Uh, a large wind turbine or a diesel locomotive is a million watts or a megawatt. Uh, the Hoover Dam produces about a gigawatt. Uh, it's very hard to comprehend or have an intuition for a terawatt of power. The world in 1890 used one terawatt. We now use 16 to 18, depending on who's counting. Um, and just to give you a last sort of shot at uh, an intuition for watts and power, um, you can think about your lifestyle. I'm going to describe my lifestyle and the power required to run it in terms of lifestyle. So this is not the illumination of genius behind me. This is actually representative of the average American's lifestyle. So there are 120, 100 watt light bulbs burning all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to run the average American's lifestyle. So um, being a bicycle commuter and running a wind energy company, I thought I was super green and I would come out way better than the average American, but you're soon to find out that I'm in fact, uh, you know, politely called, you could politely call me a planet fucker, and I have data to prove it. <laughs> so why what? Why use power? So using power enables you to compare, you, we do a whole bunch of different activities, and it enables you to compare the ones that are on very different time scales uh, in the same equation. So if you fly 105,000 miles a year, you can figure out how much energy it took to uh, fly you around. You can figure out how many seconds there are in a year, and you get a value in watts. So 7,500 watts to fly 105,000 miles. Uh, if you do something monthly, like your electricity bill, you can convert the kilowatt hours into watts, and it's 170 watts. And if you do something daily, like drink a bottle of Fiji water, it's about 90 watts for each bottle of water. So here is my lifestyle in 2007 in incredible detail. These are the 112,000 miles that I flew. As you can see, I own my own airline. This is the route map. Um, and that was equivalent to actually about 8,000 watts of power to run that, or 18,500 kilograms of CO2. 
terms of driving, I drove 10,000 miles. Um, most of it was, in fact, in a Honda Insight that gets about 65 miles per gallon, so it's the most fuel-efficient car on the road. Um, that was about 4,500 miles. I did about 2,000 miles in taxis, the equivalent of driving uh, New York to Boston and then back down to Key West. Um, as I like to pe uh, tell people, for the, my virtual trip across the southwest, I had to drive in an SUV, getting eight, 18 miles per gallon to drive safely. And then I owned a 1959 dune buggy that I drove from uh, Tucson back up to San Francisco. So that 10,000 miles sounds like a lot. That's about two-thirds. The average American drives 15,000 miles a year, and they do it in cars that are, on average, about half as efficient, so about 3,000 watts for the average American. Um, this is my house in detail, right down to my electric toothbrush, my computer, my phone charger, my laptops. Uh, the big blue ones here, these are the heat in gas. Um, so that's for running my shower, my cooking, and my heat. Um, you can see my anal retentive physicist coming out here. Um, this is the power consumption at my office. I assume a 140th share of that. Uh, turns out that we use you know, these big spikes in January and December, that's for heating our offices uh, with gas in San Francisco. The yellow is for electricity. It looks like every employee at my office runs four computers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, this is my diet converted into power. Uh, there was, so, you know, meat obviously is, th this is probably the least accurate data. We still are learning how to calculate the energy content or the carbon content of food. Overwhelmingly, meat and fish was the large one for me, followed by my share of the industrial fertilizer used in the United States, my share of the transportation fuels for food, my share of farming. So these are uh, food and ag statistics divided by 300 million people, assuming that I'm roughly uh, average of the 300 million. Turns out for my two glasses of wine that I drink per night, it's about 76 watts. So you also live in a society, and if you take, this is uh, the published data from the US government on how much diesel and how much gas and how much electricity they use for government departments, and if you take a one three hundred millionth share of all of those things, you get these sorts of numbers um, for each of them. So. That's pretty interesting. So that, that describes the government aspect of my life, my flying, my driving, my eating. But there's another significant source of uh, power consumption in your life, which is the stuff that you own. So this is basically everything I own um, and everything that I consume uh, represented. So the energy is consumed in manufacturing this thing and in disposing of it. And you can make estimates of these by what the things are made out of. So I was sh uh, quite shocked to find that one of the largest consumers of energy in my life is the New York Times. I'm delivered three days a week, represented here in newspapers. Uh, that's because I get them frequently. And they're small objects. You might not think they use a lot of energy, but you get them frequently. You may get one house in a lifetime, but you can absorb that embodied energy over the lifetime of that house. Um, you don't want to know the details down here. This is toilet paper and detergent and aluminum foil and um, obsessive compulsiveness. Uh, so, this is sort of the rough pie chart of my entire life broken down into everything. So roughly from 12 o'clock here through to about 7 o'clock, this is all of my flying. In fact, in individual trips. So this is an individual flight to Sydney from San Francisco. Um, this is all of my driving, this section here. This is my cooking and showering uh, here. All of my food. This pink section is all of my stuff. And then this section from about here up to here is my tax dollars at work. Um, so I'm, I'm about to give you an argument that you have a moral reason not to pay taxes. Um, we'll, we'll get there towards the end of the talk. Um, quite interestingly, uh, this green bar here is just the embodied energy in, in building and maintaining the 4.1 million miles of roads there are in the country. So before you even wake up every morning, 3 or 4% of the average American's energy consumption, hence uh, carbon output, is just because the roads exist before you even drive on them. So that was just me. This is me and my wife. Uh, that's a thousand people. If you went to school with a thousand, you can imagine a million people, but you can barely imagine seven billion people. So this is a, that's sort of an awkward segue into the demographics of power consumption globally. So we just found out that I use 17 or 18,000 watts of power. The average American is actually 10,400 or 11,000 watts. So I found out, to my surprise, as an environmentalist, that I'm almost twice as bad as the average American. Don't worry too much. Canadians are worse. 
That's basically because they're Americans who live somewhere cold. Um, and there are a whole host of countries that use more power per capita. They're typically places like Qatar where energy is basically free and they run air conditioners 24-7. Um, this, so that's the American average there. The green line at the bottom, this is the global average power consumption. So it's about 2,200 watts per person globally. So these are the top 50 countries in the world. The scary thing is that China, this, this would be an Al Gore moment where you walk off the slide, um, but China's about 30 feet that way, and India is about 60 feet that way, in that China is about 1,950 or 2,000 watts per person. India is about 1,100 watts per person. So think about that in terms of population demographics. All right, I'll skip that um, so we can understand how we produce all of the energy we use globally um, in terms of where it comes from, so oil, coal, natural gas, biofuels, hydro. And all of, so producing all of the energy, so humanity uses 16, let's call it 16 terawatts of power globally. We do it dominantly, predominantly with carbon-based fuels. That leads to this famous graph. That's the CO2 rising in the atmosphere. You're all probably quite familiar with that. And then you might say, well, if we're apportioning, let's, let's look at the history of, of CO2. So this is where America comes out on top. So since the Industrial Revolution um, or started, or basically this data goes back to 1750, we've t counted the cumulative amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So who's responsible for what's there? And as you can see, the United States is clearly in first place. The first six countries, which is uh, the US, Russia, China, Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, they have contributed probably 60-75% of all the CO2 in the atmosphere. So we actually know who to point the figure at, the finger at in terms of uh, responsibility. Um, so very roughly, this is, a, this is the cartoon of climate, uh, of, of the carbon ecosystem. So we burn about 8 billion tons of carbon per year and put that into the atmosphere. Some of that is absorbed by the oceans, about 2 billion tons of carbon per year. And about 50-ish percent of it remains in the atmosphere, which is why every year we add about 2 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere. Um, so the scary thing on this graph is that there are 1,600 billion more tons of accessible fossil fuels. Uh, if we put all of that in the atmosphere, you can obviously more than double the, the CO2. So it's not a matter of not enough fuels, absolutely. All right, so this is uh, global temperature change. This is from the Ghana report in Britain. So this very really shows you on the ground temperature change for the last two decades. So everywhere you see a large red dot, that's a one degree Celsius uh, temperature change per decade, or about two and a half degrees Celsius change per decade in the last uh, 25 years, or we could call that about six degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very real and the, the data is showing it. All right, so I think this is the really interesting question for our time, because we are now basically controlling the global ecosystem. We're gardening our planet. What temperature do we want the terrarium to be held at? How do you even answer the question of what temperature do we, uh, do we want to be held at? So this is roughly how you might go about that. So on the left over here, we have uh, the temperature rise in degrees Celsius, and what these, and they're a little faint, but you can see the 450 uh, past per million bar here. This is sort of our confidence of if we stabilized at 450, whether we would stay below two degrees. So this is sort of a 50-ish percent chance that if we stopped at 450, we'd stay below two degrees. We know that much. So the, um, these are basically scenarios. The, there are models underneath that. The models is a physics-based model of the atmosphere. So people that have the models, then they run scenarios of what that will do to the model in terms of temperature change. And then there are these things called impact studies. These are the things you hear about in the media. Impact studies say things like at one degree Celsius, we'll lose 10% uh, of species. At two degrees, we'll lose 15 to 40% of species. At three degrees, one to four billion people, more than the existing one billion, will face water shortages, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the litany of horrors. So in terms of the quality of life question, how you might choose this target is sort of how far up this litany of horrors do you want to go? And the sort of the generally accepted idea is maybe stop at two degrees. So what do you have to do? Um, well, okay, but maybe before I say that. So I'm going to argue that, you know, what I'm going to show you what it takes to get to 450. Other people argue for different targets. And in fact, these, this is a moving target. I think it's pretty hard to argue against Jim Hansen that 350 is a target we really should go for. 
this isn't difficult because we're already at 385. So I'm just going to give you a, a sense of what change has to happen in the world to hit 450. All right, so 450 would give you two degrees. Grossly, that means you have to change this cartoon to look roughly like this. So you can only put one or two billion tons of carbon per year in the atmosphere and you can receive, and hopefully that balances out in the amount to absorb in the oceans. So this, however, won't, this is slightly inaccurate. This won't last forever because this increases ocean acidity and the ocean loses its capacity to absorb more CO2. So um, there's, in fact, a really positive trend happening in climate science, which I want to identify. Uh, that is, we're, we're looking at the climate problem differently. We used to express it in terms of percentage reductions you need to hit by a certain date. But around 20 years ago, uh, Krauss and Kumi uh, argued that maybe a more accurate way to look at it is we should just think about how much carbon can you burn before you have to go cold turkey. And so we know how, much, uh, how many uh, parts per million of CO2 you get if you burn a terawatt year of coal or a terawatt year of oil or a terawatt year of gas. We know that we're at 390. So we've got 60 parts per million before you hit 450. So that means you've got around two, uh, 400 terawatt years of fossil fuels burning. 40 years, so that would mean we could do 40 years at about half the rate humanity does now, or 20 years at the full rate uh, that we do now, and then you have to stop completely. So that's sort of to give you a sense of uh, how quickly you need to act. Um, I might skip that one. So, the really encouraging thing is that that was sort of 20 years ago, the climate community went the percentage way rather than the whole carbon way. Uh, but to, about two months ago in Nature, there were two great papers that are starting to put back into the sense, uh, into the literature, the sense that we should just aim for we have so many billions of tons of carbon left. So this is an interesting graph. I won't, this is basically your, uh, the percentage chance of hitting a two degree Celsius change. And this is the how many billions of tons of carbon we have left to burn. And so they're arguing that we have around about 190 billion tons of carbon left to burn before you um, have to stop cold turkey. This, if you use this type of analysis, it puts things in interesting perspective because you can now say, all right, the House just did the bill, the Markey Bill for Climate Change. How much carbon does that commit America to? It commits America to about 112 uh, billion tons. So it sort of says America is going to commit itself to doing 50-ish percent of the remaining carbon um, that you can put in the atmosphere. So it sort of gives you a nice tool, this, this method, for analyzing uh, if you're doing the right thing. All right, so how do we produce the 16 or 18 terawatts of power we do today? This is how we do it. So we, we do 5 terawatts of oil, 3.6 terawatts of coal, 3.2 terawatts of gas, uh, about half to one terawatt of nuclear, and not much of the renewables, hydro, wind, solar geothermal. Uh, the reason this number is 18 and often people quote 16 is because uh, a lot of people don't count all of the biomass that's used in the developing world. And so we use about five terawatts of uh, power from uh, biomass. All right, so that's, we know that's not going to last uh, 10,000 years. So what are our options in terms of renewable energy that you've heard about? to produce that 16 terawatts. So this, if you only remember one image from the entire talk, this is it. This is basically, this represents about a thousand scientific papers analyzing the total resource potential of every renewable. So about 85,000 terawatts of solar energy hits the surface of the Earth. That's good news, 85,000 is much, much larger than the 16. In second place is wind, about 3,600 terawatts of wind. Again, good news, that's much larger than global total. Um, most of that wind, however, uh, 400 is, is in the, the first 300 meters, and the rest is up higher. So that is why we started a company to work on high altitude wind power. So what's the bad news on this slide? There's only three terawatts of waves hitting every coastline on the planet. So imagine you're putting this perfect wave power device that absorbs all of the energy of the waves hitting every coastline on the planet. So you have big ocean waves rolling in, dead flat to the beach, you'll only get about one-fifth or one-sixth of humanity's power supply. So you should look carefully at huge commitments to uh, wave energy. Similarly with tidal power, so that's represented by the moon, so the moon uh, orbits the Earth and um, sucks the water up and down, and there's about three and a half terawatts of power you could get out of tidal. Interestingly, we can figure out how much power potential is in all of the biomass on the planet, and the estimates are around about 90 terawatts, 65 terawatts of that is on land. So 
sort of a first order argument about biofuels is if you want to do biofuels for all 16 terawatts, you'd have to use one quarter of every green thing on, uh, on the planet. So that's a tough one. There's geothermal. It's a little hard to count. It's, um, there's about 32 terawatts of a renewable component. That's the, the component that's caused by uh, nucleotide decay in the center of the Earth. Um, but you could tap it faster, but at the expense of cooling the Earth very slightly, the core of the Earth. Uh, interestingly, if you gathered every raindrop that hits every continent and you ran it through a perfect hydroelectric plant, you'll only make 25 terawatts, about the sum of total of humanity. Um, by the time it gets to rivers, there's only seven terawatts, and we already tap you know, about a half a terawatt of that. All right, so what's the equation? What do you have to do if you're humanity if you want to hit 450? Now, you could run this algebra again. If you said, I want to hit 500, what do I do? If I want to hit 400, what do I do? If I want to hit 350, what do I do? But let's just use uh, 450 to be illustrative. So humanity at current demand wants 16 terawatts. That means we can probably do about three terawatts of that from fossil fuels uh, in some sustainable sense. We have already about one and a half terawatts of non-carbon, so that's nuclear and hydro and renewables. So in the next 25, 30-ish years, you need to do 16 minus the existing non-carbon, about 11 and a half terawatts of new clean energy. This is ignoring population growth. This is ignoring um, increasing power requirements. All right, so let's just take that 11 and a half terawatts and imagine that we roughly apportion it equally to a bunch of different technologies. So we'll do a half a terawatt with biofuels, three terawatts with nuclear, two terawatts with geothermal, two terawatts with wind, two with solar thermal, two with photovoltaics. Again, you could rejigger the math and, and get a different result, but this is sort of a framework for thinking of the problem. So what do you have to build to do that thing we just did? So in terms of solar cells, two terawatts of photovoltaics um, requires us making about 100 square meters of solar cells every second for the next 25 years. So 100 square meters of solar cells is roughly this auditorium. So every second, second after second, for 25 years, we have to install somewhere in the planet a solar cell the size of this room. That's for reasonable 15% efficiency solar cells. You might say, let's use better solar cells. So the upper limit is about 40%. So you may do, you may only have to do 30 square meters every, every second, but it's still pretty profound. Solar thermal, this is where you take mirrors, you shine the light on a, on a heat engine, and you run the heat engine, it's like a steam engine, and that produces electricity that way. But you'd have to install 50 square meters of mirrors every second for the next 25 years. 30% efficiency is as good as we can do today. As good as we will ever do is about 40%. So you're not going to drastically change um, the algebra there. In terms of wind, two terawatts of wind is 12 three megawatt wind turbines every second uh, for the next 25 years. Oh, sorry, uh, 12 three megawatt wind turbines every hour, so that's about one. 100 uh, meter diameter turbine every five minutes for the next 25 years. 100 meter wind turbine is something four times larger than this building, uh, just grossly. So imagine building that every five minutes for 25 years. New nuclear power, uh, three terawatts would require building one three gigawatt nuclear power plant every week for the next 25 years, just to put in perspective. I think the US has, actually Tom probably knows the, the I saw Tom Friedman in the audience, he probably knows the data better than I. I think there's about 12 slated for approval in the next 10 years in the US. So we're slightly behind schedule on that. Um, so in terms of geothermal, two terawatts, that would be 300 megawatt steam turbines every day for 25 years. So uh, a 100 megawatt steam turbine is a room this big filled with stainless steel and steam engines and a couple of holes dug uh, about a mile deep either side of the building, and you have to build one of the, uh, three of those every day for 25 years, um, to put in perspective. All right, so biofuels, a lot of people like it. So I only put a half a terawatt, you'll soon see why. So if you took an Olympic swimming pool and you filled it with genetically engineered algae that was 3% efficient at converting sunlight to energy, that's better than any technology we have today, you'd have to build, fill an Olympic swimming pool with algae every second for the next 25 years to do half a terawatt. And you'd be like, oh, well, okay, maybe I don't want to pour all that cement for all those swimming pools. Let's use a natural land formation. 
and the natural land formation would be sort of Wyoming. So imagine Wyoming with the algal mat covering the whole lot. So you might say, is that industrial possible? Um, or the other way to answer that question is, what should Detroit actually do? So uh, in the United States, we, this is the good news part of the talk. Sorry, I've got everyone really bummed out. Um, now we're going to get to the good news. So uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and other bottlers and canners uh, produce about 110 billion aluminum cans per year. So if you cut this aluminum can in half and you folded it out and you polished it nicely so it was a mirror, um, that would represent about 200 gigawatts of solar thermal mirrors. So great new business model for Coca-Cola and Pepsi. I'm going to give it to them for free. Is they stop, they go back to their business model of 40 years ago, which was you just ship the sugar. That's a really efficient way of getting um, sugar water to people. You don't have to ship the water. That will relieve them of their need to make um, aluminum cans. And so within 10 years, Coca-Cola and Pepsi could do two terawatts of solar thermal. And that's how radical, uh, radically you need to think about this problem. Nokia makes nine phones every second. Nokia, Intel, AMD, uh, together perhaps with IBM as well. They, it is within industrial capacity if you sort of put all of that towards uh, solar photovoltaics to actually uh, do the two terawatts. This is just a note on how quickly your slides go out of date. Um, General Motors used to make one car every two minutes. Uh, GM and Ford, then roughly you might say could make one of those hundred, uh, one of those three megawatt wind turbines every five minutes just with their existing plant. So it is industrial possible, industrially possible again, but that's how big you need to think. So a lot of people say we need an Apollo program for energy or we need uh, a Manhattan project. Apollo programs and Manhattan projects are like, they're science projects and they might be the sort of scale of effort you put behind a fusion research project. But what we're just talking about here is much more like retooling for World War II, except that um, Japan, Germany, America, Britain are all playing on the same team, same goal. To give you an idea of what happened for the retooling for World War II, in 1939 there were 1,000 aircraft in the whole of the United States. By 1945, to build all the long-range bombers, they, were, they had produced 300,000. They had the capacity to make about 100,000 aircraft a year. So that is how you need to scale wind energy, for example. All right, this is another great news slide. You may still think it's not very possible. This let's build 10 terawatts in t or 11 terawatts in 25 years. Reality is, so this is global power consumption, 1965 to today. And we went from 5 terawatts to 15 or 16 in about 40 years. So there is precedent that industrially we have the capacity to install that much new energy. It's just that we have to do it radically differently. This time it's not uh, oil platforms and uh, coal plants. All right, so you can actually do it. But you may want to now start to think about the secondary effects of what we're going to do. So a lot of people will tell you, you only need a solar cell the size of Rhode Island to power the country. That's assuming that the solar cell is floating in space, um, getting light 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's about 27, 1,270 watts per square meter of solar energy that hits the outer atmosphere. Once it goes through day-night losses, cloud and weather losses, and geography and latitude, you only get about 90, tero, uh, 90 watts per square meter if you're in northern Europe. You get about 300 watts per square meter if you're in Arizona. The technologies are about 10 to 40 percent efficient, and then also you don't cover 100 percent of the land area. You cover maybe 50 percent with photovoltaics, about 25 percent with solar thermal. So you get about 10 to 20 watts per square meter um, of land. Similarly for wind, you can do a calculation. You get one to two, maybe three watts per square meter of land. For hydroelectricity, this is a little odd. So that's the catchment area for the Hoover Dam. It's not an internal organ. Um, and it's a, the Hoover Dam does about two gigawatts. And you can see the math. You get about three watts per square meter of land use for hydroelectric. Coincidentally, if you fill the Hoover Dam with biofuels and do the numbers, you'll also get about two to three watts per square meter. So this is my map of the world. Uh, I used to call this, um, yeah, so this is my map of the world. So this big square here represents all of the land area of the planet. The vertical lines are the land areas of all of the countries. So these are the biggest countries by land area in the world, Russia, China, Canada, USA, Brazil, and Australia. So this other stripe here is a new country I call Renewistan. Renewistan is 10 terawatts of renewable energy, taking good wind technology, good solar, good hydro, and good biofuels, 
and the land area for 10 terawatts is going to be the seventh largest country in the world. So, you know, as we embark on this effort, we should understand that we are going to build a machine sort of the size of a continent or half a continent. That's what is required. And I really just have this to temper a lot of enthusiasm for we're going to have renewable energy, so we can all have infinite energy, we can live our lifestyles the same way. That's just not true. So this is really helps you understand the sort of efficiency problem. All right, so putting yourself back into the picture. All right, so um, the global average, there's you know, 16 terawatts, 6.7 billion people, 2,400 watts per person. Um, so how would I go about living a 2,400 watt life? How would you go about living a 2,400 watt life, assuming you just wanted to be egalitarian about how much energy everyone gets? So this is my old life, 17,000 watts, you remember that. Here's my new life, I'm going to get it down to about 2,290 watts. So how do I do that? So I now get to fly once a year to Boston, um, once every three years to visit my family in Australia, once every five years to Europe, and once every 10 years I go surfing in Hawaii. That would reduce my flying energy to about 983 watts. This is my new driving habits. Um, I now do two trips per month in a really efficient hybrid to work, one trip a month carpooling to go and visit our investors in uh, San Jose, this is the Bay Area. Uh, and if you know me well, you know what I'm about to say is a lie. So instead of taking six trips per year to see my in-laws about an hour away and two trips to go surfing, I'm going to flip that. Um, the first time I gave this talk, my father-in-law was in the audience, so I had to appease him. All right, so in terms of my new uh, eating, I now call myself, I'm actually trying as hard as I can to live to this new footprint. And you know, as an inventor and engineer, forcing yourself to live this lifestyle actually exposes to you everything that's broken in the world, and it's like, I see every business model for the next 25 years, because I'm now having to invent my way, or as a friend of mine puts it, I'm learning to live the way I'd like everyone else to live. So it, it's pretty interesting. So I now call myself 6 sevens vegetarian. That means I only eat meat once a week, so that got the meat down a lot. Um, you can now understand the hardest piece of this talk for me is to go to one glass of red wine a night, 38 watts. Um, and there's an implicit assumption in this that is probably wrong. So this is, again, how little we know about energy and agriculture. I assume that if I go to locally grown organic, I'll halve the um, farming energy and the transportation energy. Actually, that doesn't look like it's true. Um, there are benefits to the scale of industrial agriculture. But we, we will learn more and more about that. In terms of stuff, all of those things I have, my underwear, my boats, my house, my TVs, my iPhones, and my iPods, that used to represent about 2,500 watts. How do you change that? Well, there's two ways. You either have one-tenth as much stuff, or you make your stuff last 10 times as long. So you amortize that energy over a much longer period. And so how would you do that? I call this the, you, you, you have the Rolex or Mont Blanc approach to life. So I just had a son. He's now 13 weeks old. I will give him a Rolex uh, watch, and I'll give him a Mont Blanc pen. And I'll say that's the only writing implement you get for life, and that's the only watch you get for life. Um, but he will have a high quality timekeeping and writing experience, much higher quality than the 4,000 disposable pens that he would have otherwise used and the 50 disposable watches. Problem with that is there's a credit problem and it sounds pretentious. You know, the, the, future, the, <laughs> the green solution is, is luxury. I'm not sure that that's what you want to get across, but I am trying to say very, in a very deep sense, we need to own less stuff and make it last longer. And I think that we, we could have another discussion about the share economy around that, if you like. Uh, so here's a note on products. Um, so this is, ironically, a drink called energy water. Um, it used to be in the fridge at my office. So this is, it has a nutrition label that you're used to seeing. This is a, new, uh, a consumption label that we actually generate, generate automatically at our website, uh, What's On. And you can figure out just by weighing the thing, pretty much what the materials, how much energy went into making it, we know the recycling rate and landfill rates, et cetera. And you can figure out how much energy went into making this thing. And it turns out if I'm trying to live a 2,000 watt lifestyle, drinking one bottle of that per day is 4.5% of my daily allowance. So that would make you look radically different at drinking that. So what are you going to choose? Disposable soft drink every day or a second glass of red wine? Right, so this is the, these are the quality of life issues that we're going to face. Um, definitely no how I'm going to vote. All right, so 
Everything here is predicated on also, as well as doing everything that we said, so we do this amazing retooling for new energy infrastructure, we also have to turn off all of the current CO2 emitters in the same time period. This is probably the hardest piece of the problem. Uh, and I'll obviously stop deforestation. Oh, so this is my other good news slide. Um, this is US energy consumption in terawatts, graphed for the last century, graphed against the economy. So the only four times, uh, it will now be five, you'll know why, that we have reduced energy consumption in the US were the Great Depression, the oil crisis, the recession, and the six months after September 11th when we stopped flying. So uh, the data is not really in, but it's probably falling off a cliff right now. So this is actually good and bad news. Good news is the recession is great for the environment. Bad news is we don't know how to get out of it without just ramping up the energy consumption. So that's sort of the technology invention problem uh, we have ahead for us. All right, so I have a, a whole bunch of other things. But to tie it back to the age of consequence, um, so we can, you know, th this, these calculations aren't perfect, but they're getting better. These calculations are three times better than what we, how we could calculate carbon footprints three years ago. And that's ten times better than we could do five years before that. In reality, we are getting more and more and more and more data about the consequence of every object in our life. So I could actually now say to you in a very real sense, if we have this model of the climate that there's so many tons of carbon you can emit before you have to stop, and if we know how much carbon was produced in doing this, I can actually tell you, well, if I had that energy drink, that drinking that energy drink once puts t uh, three times 10 to the minus 21 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So in a very real sense, we now know the exact consequence, give, you know, modulo the errors we have in the climate model, of every action. And so this should scare you in the audience because you're uh, sort of, I assume everyone's a little, about my age or older, and it should be encouraging for young people. So my son should now be able to run a class action against me. He should be able to say to me, your ex Dad, you're expecting me to pay off your social security and your health care when you retire in 25 years. Um, I'm going to refuse to do that because I can point the smoking gun exactly how many parts per million of CO2 you were responsible, how many degrees Celsius you were responsible for in um, changing the climate that you're putting me in. And so I think this is sort of an interesting issue. You know, how do you address the intergenerational unfairness of climate change or the, the Ponzi scheme of climate change? And it may just have to be intergenerational extortion. So if you have a 10-year-old against your own interests, you need to now motivate them to do futures in suing you. Um, if you know what I mean. So they're suing you, know, they're refusing to pay your healthcare benefits 20 years out so that you actually create the policies and the technologies we need and the adoption we need today. And so I think, you know, I, I'm not sure that companies really get this yet, this age of consequence. You know, we are going to be able to point with ever more accuracy the smoking gun at every single product we have, every service, every energy provider, etc. And so don't, you know, I think people think the they have the model in the head that what we know today is what we're going to know for the next 50 years. We're just going to know this with much more accuracy, and it's going to, I think, really change the industrial landscape in, in fascinating ways. Uh, with that, I might stop for uh, questions. I'm sure there'll be a bunch. And I'll try to be super optimistic and tell you that it's going to be all OK. All right. Um, all right, so let me guess. Okay, so there are the, of the components that I broke down into my food, I guess your question is, what is fertilizer versus what is farming energy versus what is transportation? So the, again, the, 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 agri you know, the people who monitor ag gross agricultural statistics know how many gallons of diesel we use to ship food around the country. Um, so that's the transportation piece, and that's my one three hundred millionth share of it. The farming piece is the energy, the electricity, and to run the processing plants, the things that convert the raw food stock into actual foods, and then it also drives the tractors and the combine harvesters. So that's the energy of running all of the farms. And the fertilizer piece is basically fertilizers um, are really based on nitrogen, and the way we make synthetic nitrogen um, is 
by you know, extracting it from natural gas. So it's a very energy intensive process to make synthetic nitrogen and that is what comprises our fertilizer. The curious statistic I just heard is that 50% of the nitrogen in your body, and there's a lot of nitrogen in your body, is actually synthetic. So 50% of your nitrogen comes from um, synthetically derived uh, uh, nitrogen sources. So that's what that source is. Saul, thank you very much. Um, I've listened to a lot of talks on, on energy and the environment and carbon footprints and that. And uh, all of them seem to be very pessimistic. Right. And all of them seem to give answers that are basically unsolvable. Uh, if, if you extrapolate that to the, to the end, it seems that unless we do solve these problems, which seem unsolvable, catastrophic things are going to happen to the Earth. Uh, and there seems a, a relatively simple answer that deserves a lot of study that I've never heard brought up at one of these things, and that's if we have... All, all of this is caused by population. Have there been any studies of population reduction and how we would reduce the population so that we wouldn't be burning the energy in the first place and how much population reduction we would need so that we could live in a safe world and how we would accomplish that. Right, so th this is the, the nightmare question for me because you don't want to stand up here and advocate um, population control. I, 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 haven't, I haven't been able to figure out where morally and ethically I sit on one-child policies. So to dodge that question, I'll, I'll maybe say some other, th uh, two other anecdotes about population that are super interesting. So there is this common received wisdom that we're going to have 9 to 10 billion people by 2050. So w people argue that our m climate models are inaccurate. Um, I think the climate modeling is now, is, is very well known and has uncertainties certainly, but it's, it's very well known. But in the scenarios that we have for humanity, that's one of the inputs that, we, that you put into the model one of the, the lines is population. Those population models are based on essentially linear regression of traditional population growth. There's no feedback built into population models. So we don't have feedback in those models for AIDS. We don't have feedback in them for reduced agricultural productivity due to climate change. We don't have feedback. So I think, we should, I think the common wisdom, this 9 or 10 billion, it should be really examined in detail. I, I, sus I suspect it won't go that high. Um, two examples are, you know, Eastern Europe has basically negative population growth, as does Africa, for two different reasons. One is raising education and the, the prevalence of television, and the other one is AIDS. So there are, you know, there are very large portions of the Earth, the whole of Northern Europe, that have negative population growth in their societies. So, you know, I think the... I would like someone to study in much more detail the assumptions of the population numbers. But then... Um, Maybe one further anecdote is, assume you've said we all go to two billion people, then you would really just raise the average amount of power we can each use with this massive effort by about you know, double to maybe 5,000 watts per person. And then uh, you can still see that that's a big reduction in energy through efficiency measures, et cetera, for the average American. Oh, the one thing I didn't mention about my new life, my, um, you know, my 2,000... Uh, my 2009 life, which will be 2,000 watts, is to get to 2,200 watts, I have to stop paying taxes and the 3,000 watts that the US government spends on my behalf. Right? So I don't, I'm not advocating civil disobedience and mass tax evasion, but I think in the, you know, we're, we're all concerned with transparency of government right now. I think we're going to examine in f far greater detail how the government actually uses energy and carbon on our behalf. Um, to tie a whole bunch of ideas together. Yeah. Some of the larger parts of your carbon footprint are petrol and diesel and electric. Uh, you know, you can tie what happens in that. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the electricity grid and how the electric grid is working? All right, so this is a super question. Best way to make a 200 mile per gallon car is to take a 20 mile per gallon par car and put 10 people in it. Like that's the, the Mexican or the African method. Um, and absolutely, that's sort of at the bottom of this question of the use factor for all the cars. So maybe I'll tell, so to talk about the cars, I actually just factored in roughly 50% of the time I'm car sharing and I had those cars. 
Um, so I may be able to double, I may be able to do better there. For flying, it's interesting. I used actual published statistics from JetBlue and from Virgin Airways on their passenger occupancy and how much diesel they use for the year, and they make that available in their annual reports because they're a public company. And so they have 84 or 87% occupancy, and you can figure it out. So you might get 13% better if you have you know, the plane complete, completely packed. Or you might get, you might double it if you remove all the seats and you just have everyone swinging in hammocks and you know they're really packed in like sardines. So you you can you can so there's there's another um, there's a technological optimist. I'm a technologist and I'm an optimist, um, despite what it might sound. Um, but there's a technological optimism that is dangerous. So everyone's like, oh, we'll just invent better aircraft. And I sort of have an answer to that. You know, thermodynamics as a discipline is like 150 years old, and so we've done an amazing job. We know the upper there's a thing called the Carnot cycle efficiency, and that's the ultimate efficiency that you can get from any sort of heat engine or internal combustion engine. And jet aircraft are, are, are about 90% of as, as good as you will ever get. Um, so we might double through a whole lot of efforts uh, or halve the amount of energy in flying, but you're not going to get a factor of 10 improvement, right? You can get a factor of 10 improvement, which is sort of what you need in all of these things, by making your, your objects last 10 times as long and having fewer of them. You can get a factor of 10 improvement um, in your driving if you go to an electric motor scooter, right? Um, factor of 10 is what we need. So when, when Tesla announces, oh, we have a 100 mile per gallon equivalent electric car, I'm like, whoop de doo So in 1933, the French president went to an engineer called Boulanger who worked at Citroën and said, I need a car for the people. I've heard that Hitler's working on one. Um, which was the Beetle, and he, in a very French way, said, the car I'd like, to build, I'd like you to build me should carry four peasants to market at 60 kilometers per hour, that's about 35 miles per hour. It should get, uh, I think he said, 70 miles per gallon, and it should leave the eggs in the rear seat unbroken by the time they get to market, driving over unplowed fields. So this romantic vision or, or, or a design brief. In 1938, Boulanger delivered an eight and a half horsepower car called the De Chavaux, you might know it as the 2CV, and it got 78 miles per gallon. Right, so 1938, 78 miles per gallon, 2008, 100 miles per gallon. I'm just not impressed. Right? We want 200 miles per gallon. How do you do that? You have to go to lightweight vehicles. Electric is good. So you know, the electric motor scooter should be your model. That's sort of a mass answer. Um, electric two-seat sports cars, they're a niche answer. So we really... We need to temper our technological optimism with reality, because then it makes you come back to what I mentioned at the beginning. It's a design. We're designing the aesthetics of the planet. We're designing our quality of life. So let's not say this is all a technological problem. Let's actually admit to ourselves that this is about designing how we're going to live. So let's, you know, this is why there's a lot of discussion about urban redesign, so that you don't have to have the car, so that you can have, you know, you can have a high quality of life. As a friend of mine very eloquently puts it. Do you really want to, do you want to walk hand in hand with your kid to school every morning or do you want an hour in a traffic jam, right? Everyone says, I choose quality of life, the walking hand to hand to school with my kid. That's what we, we want to do and that would be super high quality of life and low energy, but what we actually are all doing is choosing the thing that we don't even like. So if we can, I think to get to this level that it's an aesthetic and a design problem for climate change, it also is more embracive of more people, so you, you allow not just the technologists to feel like this is part of their problem. You know, it's about figuring out really high quality ways to live. Actually, my favorite game is taking this graph. Sorry to show you all the slides backwards. Uh, here we go. All right, so this is power per capita use in 2003 for all the countries in the world. I like to go down this graph and find the country with the highest quality of life per uh, unit of energy per capita. And so I think it's probably, in my mind, it's a race between Greece and Portugal at about 4,000 watts per person. I think they have a much higher quality of life than the average American. And so then you, you do that and then you go visit those countries and you say, what are they doing right? So that's sort of part of the design problem for climate change, right? How do we change those cultural things? Um, let me try to take us a different direction because I'd love your comments on it. <clears throat> Since if we do all these things, it doesn't quite get us there, not that we shouldn't try to do all these things. Talk about things like we can do exterior to the 
earth to control like reflectors in space, et cetera. All those have consequences, what temperature you try to wind up with. What are the things we can do beyond this that would control it? And, so this and that's is, just one example. So this, this, is a, this is a great question. So there's a few glaring emissions from my talk. One of them is uh, carbon sequestration, and the other one is climate engineering. And they're, they're, they're related. So the question here is, how, what are the things that you can do that aren't purely in the energy base? And so I, I don't want this talk to be an argument for um, geoengineering, because personally I'm not a fan. I'm a little nervous about running an experiment with the terrarium that we all live in, which is sort of what it is. Um, but the things you can do are things like putting sulfurous particles in the upper atmosphere that will reflect light back out into space. It doesn't solve the CO2 problem, but it's sort of like artificially blowing the top off a volcano and cooling the earth that way. Some people just propose nuking a volcano and <laughs> cooling the earth that way. There are other, there's other proposals to, um, you can do a lot by reforestation and potentially, although the science is out as yet, in things called terra preta and, and putting, basically putting a lot more carbon back into the soils. Um, and you can see, you can see here, this is why I have this slide. So in all of the uh, vegetation in the world, all the green stuff, there's about 700 billion tons of carbon. That's why you don't do the deforestation. If you burn all the plants, you double the atmospheric CO2. There's about 3,000 billion tons of carbon in today's soils. So potentially you can dump a whole lot more carbon into those soils. So these are the, the terra preta type approaches. Um, they're slower. So there's a friend of mine called Dan Schrag at Harvard. He's actually been convening a lot of conferences on geoengineering. He was also fairly um, uh, temperate about it, I would say. But his approach was, well, you know, if you do the math and you, you do this type of analysis and you really look at the picture, you can't leave anything off the table. So I may as well add some science to what was previously pretty much crazy. It was a crazy kook's thought about geoengineering. And what he says of it is we should choose the ones that have a quick on and off switch. So if you blow the top off a volcano with a nuclear weapon, like you, 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 don't have a, you can't moderate that, the result of that as it's an experiment. So he's a fan of things that you can test at small scale. You can see if they're moving in the right, right direction. If they're not, you can turn them off. And so that's sort of my philosophy. I think, I think that's a good wisdom. If we're going to play with these things, we have to acknowledge that it's it's going to have crazy political connotations because some people want to do more of it, some people less. But we also have to do it in a carefully measured scientific way um, to make sure we get the end result that we want. My name is Aaron Cook, and I'm, my question is, if we're not able to do the things that you're talking about, what are some of the things that we should be doing to, to adapt our cities and communities that we live in to adjust to these potential new realities? I... Yeah, so there's a lot of talk about adaptation. Um, I actually don't know how you adapt for three meters of sea level change in a century. I mean, that's, that, that buries New York and London and, and Bangladesh and un underwater. So I, I actually find it really hard to imagine some of those adaptations. Like, you know, the, the Dutch adapted a small island for a, a foot of sea change, but, you know, it's a, it's a slightly larger project. Um, and so I'm sort of just hoping that we don't choose, we don't look at adaptation as an easy thing. And then, and that sort of, to, to my mind, you know, we, we all worry about the gloom and doom and the crazy scenarios for uh, climate change. And I'm not sure that it's going to be a climate change that really is the thing that screws it all up. I think it's bizarre side effects of climate change. And to give you just, this is not necessarily what's going to happen, but this is how you might imagine bizarre unintended consequences of climate change. So. Um, India and Pakistan are neighboring countries, both are nuclear armed. One, is, one looks to be US backed, one looks to be China backed. Um, all of the water that flows into Pakistan, or 95%, comes through uh, India off the, the Himalayas. Uh, that glacial melt will, will go away as a consequence of climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I want you to think about the consequences of two nuclear armed not terribly friendly countries, one of them is now no longer giving the water for the required agriculture to the other country, right? Play that out in your mind. I could give you 20 more of those scenarios. So um, I, this is sort of the, the adaptation just seems a little naive. Like how do you adapt for 
those circumstances. You know, I think the, the US State Department mobilizes troops if they hear of 50,000 refugees anywhere. That's going to be 50,000 refugees means a big humanitarian problem and probably a border war somewhere. And you know, you're talking tens or hundreds of millions of climate refugees. I, I, I just, I don't know how you adapt. So maybe I just have a lack of imagination, so therefore I just want to solve the problem. And it is solvable, but we just, I think, you know, part of the reason to give this talk is like, we want to have, I, want, I just want more intellectual honesty in the conversation, right? There isn't an, you know, we do know enough if we, you know, Sure, I actually hope that the climate scientists are wrong, but I believe that they are correct and the scientific method is good and we know a lot. But, you know, irrationally I have a sign, I hope they're wrong. But you should be making decisions on the best knowledge of all the best people that you have who've thought about it. And if you're making those decisions, then you should think about it logically. What are the real things? What do you have to do? What is the schedule? You know, that would be the German government response, right? We must install this, you know, by next week this and the following week that. But that's not how globally we're addressing this. It's, it's um, you know, so, and that's why I'm trying to sort of popularize this, this age of consequence idea, right? We know enough to sort of really act with the specifics to hit a target. So the big, the bit disappointing thing with a lot of the climate conferences is they talk about percentage reductions as opposed to here is the end goal. You give the, you know, I'm an engineer, as an engineer, if you, if you give an engineer the end goal, they figure out how to do it. And, you know, if you gave the end goal as 450, I've shown you, engineers could do it. And we'd co-opt to the aluminum production facilities and, and Nokia and the silicon production facilities and you'd get the job done. But we actually just need to put the stake in the ground of what the end result is and then you can work backwards. say in terms of the population control one, um, if you were giving this talk in India, I could imagine the man standing up there and saying, um, uh, how do we deal with, the, uh, with consumption control? Yeah. Uh, as Paul Ehrlich's pointed out, there's no prophylactic for consumption. Um, there's no morning after pill for a binge at Macy's. So, My new phrase um, is I'm <laughs> planning the obsolescence of planned obsolescence. Right. Oh. So, <laughs> so I, it's, it's, we, we tend to speak about population control. They speak about consumption control, and I think it's finding the right balance between the two. I want to get you to talk a little bit more about this adaptation. My instincts are exactly like yours. When I actually wrote about this. I actually left the word adaptation out of my book. Right. Um, because the people, Petty and L like Bjorn Lomborg, struck me as deeply dishonest people who were basically climate deniers um, who were kind of hiding behind adaptation. And I also agree with you that, um, you know, making it the centerpiece uh, is really ludicrous because everything you do to mitigate in terms of technological innovation would help you adapt. Right. So this idea that there was a choice between adaptation and mitigation struck me as ludicrous. That said, the more I've been sort of reading about it, and if you, ever, if you go to the EPA website, right. uh, they actually don't have a, a, a long section on adaptation of some very sensible things that happened before three meter rise. And I just want you to elaborate, because I'm trying to think this through myself a little bit more, on is there, is there something between Bjorn Lomborg, you know, and a really honest strategy about adaptation, where, where it would fit in. That's, that's kind of what I'm wrestling with. Um, I think there is. And you see what I'm getting at? I, I, mean, I, I see what yeah. you're getting at. And, I, and you... Can we shoot? Uh, it, it would it be irresponsible not to think about this? And uh, Yeah, in exactly you know, the same way it's irresponsible yeah. for Dan Schrag not to think about right. and convene scientific conferences yeah. about um, you know, climate control. I think it's irresponsible not to think about adaptation. I mean, the first thing I would be paranoid about is that food and agricultural system. And so understand in far more detail every crop option that we have that is low water. Um, there was a great tall talk, was it Paul Ehrlich? I can't remember the gentleman's name uh, yesterday. Jason Clay. Jason Clay, fantastic talk about how do you feed nine billion people. I mean, we had an interesting discussion about the nine billion assumptions. But you want to shore up agriculture really quickly um, and you know, you're going to have a salination of an awful lot of water uh, water tables with, with sea level rise. So I think that's the first one. Um, what are the really important things after that? I'm not, I, I think actually, I like your argument. I think you, you said the right thing. All adaptation strategies are, are really what you need for mitigation anyway. So it is learning how to build low water composting toilets, you know, 
that this is just great. As a technologist, we think mobile phones are tech, high technology. Mobile phones are gadgets. High technology for the next 25 years are going to be things that sound incredibly unromantic, like um, solar hot water heating and uh, composting toilets, right? Um, Except less stuff that lasts longer. And less stuff that lasts longer. It's also about adaptation. Yeah, and that is also, that is also about adaptation. Um, yeah, it's, I actually, so I'm, I'm not going to embarrass myself by not thinking deeply about this one live, because I think it is a deeply hard question, and maybe we can take that offline. I think it is, it, you can't say, I mean, you have to do everything. You have to keep everything on the table, including adaptation, um, and, it, and it is a tough one to think about. But you know, my first thrust of defense is all about agriculture and conserving water. Yeah. It would seem, uh, at least in the higher consumption or per capita consumption area of the, wor of the world that uh, migration to more temperate climates would be a big factor. Yeah, there's something hidden in this energy per capita graph that these are super, super hot or super, super cold countries and these are Mediterranean climates, right? So that, how, you, how do you have a high quality of life at low energy? You move to Greece or you move to Turkey or the Mediterranean. Um, but I'm not sure that mass migration to temperate climates is, is practical on a 20-year time frame. We're already struggling with urbanization and packing people into, into cities. So I think that... That is, uh, that, is, that is difficult. But I, you know, there are encouraging things. There are very low energy houses coming out of Germany now that can, um, can you know, that have almost used no energy to keep them at the right temperature year round in very cold Germany. So we have to choose those things. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm going to avoid your question and answer another one that I wanted to ask myself. <laughs> um, so. I don't want to truly avoid it, uh, and it, it is true, but I don't have an answer for the result because I, I just don't see us all moving to temperate climates. Um, but the, you, there's something that we don't ask, and I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's starting to appear in the scientific literature and the climate literature. How much energy does it take to build um, you know, this infrastructure that I just described? So where was the infrastructure? You know, when we, when we build all of that renewable energy, all of these guys, um, we can actually model today very accurately how much carbon it will take to produce two terawatts of photovoltaics using existing coal and oil plants. Because you're going to have to use fossil fuels to build them, right? Same for the wind and wind turbines because they're concrete and steel, and same for the nuclear power plants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you ask yourself the question, what is, how much carbon do we put in the atmosphere when we just do this 11 and a half clean terawatts. And for kicks, we'll also throw in 500 million green homes like this German one. And we'll throw in, uh, I think, 500 million 100 mile per gallon electric cars. <coughs> and it's about 20 parts per million or 25 parts per million of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere in that infrastructure change. So in some, you know, everyone's like, well, when do you have to act, da 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 da. Soon, 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 soon. It's like it's 25 parts per million sooner just by the, the fact that you have to invest so much energy and carbon up front in the infrastructure change. Now, there's very naive assumptions in that, and people could tear me apart because they'll say, as more solar comes online, you produce your new solar power plants with solar, et cetera. But you know, the zeroth order analysis is a little, t uh, a little scary about um, what do you build today uh, or, and, and, and how do you do it. And, you know, everyone... so. All the wealthy people are running out and building their green homes, and they'll build another green home every 10 years for the next <laughs> 20 years. And the amount of energy that goes into that cancels, um, could cancel the benefit of, of doing the, the green home. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, I'll, this one here and then that one. Yeah. Um, if, I know this is an adaptation question, however, I can't help but think about urban living versus suburban straw, sprawl in terms of transportation, in terms of housing. Um, any number of things. I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Um, so, so more specifically, the question? Uh, well, the, um, the concept of urban living and people living in smaller spaces closer together as opposed to individual houses, um, use of transportation, buses, trains, bicycles, etc., by large portions of the population as opposed to the trend up until now which has been towards uh, suburban sprawl. 
So absolutely, and the data is in and it absolutely works and people in New York are about half as energy intensive as people in the rest of the country and um, it's principally by not having long commutes, so we're gonna have to redesign the, the you know. I, uh, I might express this problem in a as a historical anecdote that's a little distressing for your country now, my country, America. America, did, you know, Europe did its boom, so if you go to Portugal, all the houses and the communities were built 800 years ago. So their house walls are this thick and the windows are tiny so they're, and they're made out of um, uh, stone so they have got high thermal mass and they use almost no energy. The cities are really densely packed. Their cities were developed in a time of energy shortage so they naturally designed and built cities that would cope with it. America built all of its infrastructure since World War II in a period of free energy which enabled you to have suburbs anywhere and you know, encourage one and a half hour commutes and, and malls and um, you know, the huge road infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in some respects, the challenge for America is a little more challenging than it is for Europe or China or Portugal or anywhere else because the existing infrastructure is m way further away from what it should be um, than it is. And so that's, that's sort of an interesting, I think you're, you're spot on, you have to do it and you wanna go to the, the Danish styles of of, of community living and bicycles. And that's again returns to the point of, you know, this is how you can have a handle in. This is an aesthetic choice and design choices that we're making. We're choosing the quality of life. And so, you know, we can engage an awful lot more people in this challenge if you say, design me the highest quality of life you can living in a high density urban environment. And there's existence proof out there that you can have an extremely high quality of life in, in those conditions, way better arguably than the, you know, the suburban lifestyles that we have. So here, then in the front, I think. Thank you, Dick Simon. Um, you, you are clear that you're not talking primarily about carbon sequestration now, but could you spend just a couple of moments addressing that? I mean, some of the, just looking at your slides and data on vegetation, um, and then some of the other things that I've seen on plantings, and in particular bamboo, and then certain species of bamboo, so that in addition to doing things to mitigate the problem from a consumption standpoint, you can actually directly address it by reducing the carbon in the atmosphere. Right, so I was trying to find a slide because I do talk about um, sequestration a little. Uh, I'm a little nervous about sequestration because we don't really have full-scale tests running today that work. So um, clean, clean coal uh, is nominally fully sequestered um, CO2 from the coal plant. And they'll do that by compressing the coal and then burying it either in porous rock or at the bottom of the ocean. We haven't run those experiments at full scale to have, you know, 100% confidence that it's going to sit there for 100 years. So I'm a little nervous about it, but I think we absolutely should uh, do that research and that investigation. And it's really, it's only, I think, $6 billion to run a full scale experiment for CO2 uh, sequestration from a couple of coal plants. Uh, and you ask the coal companies, you know, you, $6 billion, that's in the noise of, I think it's a $22 billion uh, research budget at uh, Chevron, for example. I know that number. So, dear Mr. Chevron, will you put $6 billion into this full-scale CO2? No, the government should do it. Government, would you like to put $6 billion into this CO2? <laughs> no, industry should do it. But, you know, $6 billion in the context of this problem is not a lot. We should run that experiment. I mean, you, you want... You want to basically go down the unknowns and say, is this ac actually going to work or not? And we don't actually, with full confidence, know that that version of sequestration works. There are interesting proposals around biofuels that you could do fully sequestered biofuels. Th there are technologies for burning biofuels you know, to, to make electricity that would actually enable you to capture the CO2 at a far lower cost than if you have to catch it off the back end of a smokestack. Um, and there's another catch-22 in, in carbon sequestration that's interesting. I think the numbers are, um, they're going to be roughly correct. If you do the CO2 sequestration pre-combustion of your fossil fuel, uh, it, you need about 30% more energy going into that plant, um, which means you need 1.3 tonnes of coal for every tonne of coal. If you do it post-stack, so at the end of the smokestack, it's about 70%. So you would need to almost double the amount of um, fuel you have. And so that will actually impact fuel prices and shortages to do this carbon sequestration. 
again, we don't we don't quite know enough, so let's put um, a, a, a check in those check in all of those check boxes. But that you know, they're they're billion dollar projects. We just need to sort of sack up and, and do it. Uh, does that fully answer? Oh, planting trees. Yeah, so I'm, there's a lot of impressive looking things, and I hope that some of them are truly impressive. Um, and indeed, bamboo has you know, prodigious growth rates of, of, of carbon by mass, um, and we could bury it. The, the question with those things is, again, we don't know if you bury them whether the termites will get it and turn it into methane. Or, or whether you know one fire in Indonesia, um, could, you know rainforest could burn out all of the sequestered carbon you've bought in offsetting your products. There's an interesting thing when you do these statistics on. Um, I'm sorry again to slide you through this, but this graph. Uh, so this graph comes from um, International Energy Agency. You know, cumulative national uh, CO2 emissions from you know for 250 years, and I think in about 60th place there is an event, not a country, which was the uh, the forest fires in Indonesia and Borneo in 1997, and so there are you know more than half of the nations of the world have produced less carbon than one forest fire, and so again there's sort of an unproven with the sequestering by planting. Um, that you, you'll actually do it if you, you know, if you have these fires. That said, I think we should be planting everywhere. If you, if you want to talk about a stim if the stimulus package, package's actual goal was to put people to work, I think the numbers worked out it was $700 billion and it was meant to put 4 million people back to work. Then it meant that it was costing $200,000 per job in that stimulus to create jobs in that stimulus package. I'm pretty sure for $40,000 a job, I could put 16 million people to work planting trees and America would look pretty good in a couple of years. So, the, the, you know, there's an argument in favor, and I think we, we have to do it, but I'd, li I'd like to know more about the results, and then we're going to have to learn how we manage these carbon gardens um, better than we know today. Yeah. I think this was next. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how to, to, to say this, but I organized Earth Day in 1970, and I went to the human side. I didn't, all my friends became the technical people or the science people or lawyers. And I, I worked with Margaret Mead and Jane Jacobs and William White and people like that who were thinking about community. And there was this kind of uh, moment in time when that was really, really important. That moment in time is coming back again. And I think the ability to adapt, if you know, uh, if you take this information, this information isn't going to motivate people, uh, I don't think. I think that there's a way to motivate people which is to show the enormous benefit of living in a healthy community. And I think everywhere people will, will resonate with that if we can uh, show how appealing that is. We do something called placemaking. And when we go into a community, they're just amazingly insightful, intuitive, understanding about how that community can become a better place where they can become more tied together with people where their consumption patterns go down, where they, they barter things rather than, than you know, always buying something. Yep. So I think that has such enormous potential, but I haven't, and we, we're seeing this convergence uh, all around the world on these things, but it hasn't kind of come together to where it really resonates in powerful ways where 10-year-olds uh, can help to define how that community is going to work from a public space point of view, from a uh, right. All, all, I mean, that, to me, the library is a is a whole can hold be redefined. The school can be redefined. So I, I, around I, all these issues that can be transformative in ways we could never imagine. Yeah. So I, I absolutely love this question, and you know, in some respect, this everything you see here was just my therapy. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, I yeah. wanted to understand. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good way to say I, it. I wanted to understand very personally and very yeah. really how much of a hypocrite I was, and then it's turned out that now I, I know what I need to work on for the next 25 years, because I know in detail how much benefit I get from replacing newspapers versus better yeah. ways to wake wine or whatever. Right. But then, you know, I would give this talk and people say, well, you know, give us the, the you're now trying to live this low energy lifestyle, how's it going? And in, in nearly every way, 
my new lifestyle is improving my quality Im of life. Immensely. And, yeah. and that is, you know, I'm eating less, and I, you know, I've lost yeah. 10 pounds, I'm eating far more healthily, and because I only eat meat once a week, I have the best meat from a cow named Betsy that, you know, was monk raised and massaged on Sundays. <laughs> and um, so that's fabulous. You know, I'm exercising a lot more. I was already a bicycle commuter, but I'm now, you know, semi-religious about bicycle commuting, and so that's fantastic. Spending more time with my family, uh, just sort of inherently, because I'm doing less business travel. We all hate business travel. One of the, you know, for the people in this audience, the f you know, if, if you said, in order, what should I do? The first thing you should do is invest $20,000 in the highest resolution video conferencing system you can, or just get Skype for free, and stop traveling and do everything by Skype. You know, I work with vendors in, in every continent on the, the, the planet, and I very rarely have to fly to them anymore, because we just do it all video conferencing. Uh, living closer together is actually good. I mean, we have dinner parties at my house three or four days a week. I think there's a huge number of benefits. Um, I think a really interesting thing is... Uh, but you, let me just... You're, what you're talking about is yourself. Right. Now, and that's but I'm great. Trying to, I'm trying to give selling points for yeah. how your life improves. No, and those are yeah. good. But now move it to the community. How do you create those same kinds of things in your neighborhood? We're taking... We live in Brooklyn, and we're taking the back fences down so we can have community gathering places out in the back uh, and, uh, and we will never have to move because we can now collectively do things together th as we get older that we will never need to buy another house. We, we can be there for our entire yeah, life. And I, and I so there's all great. these community-based things that add a whole other level to how we live personally our lives. So it, it, two more thoughts th uh, relating to your thing. I think we've done an unbelievably bad job of communicating how cool this new world can be. Yes. That's and to right. repeat That's right. to repeat things yeah. that I said in another yeah. forum, but maybe you weren't all there. Yeah. You know, I, I I do a lot of work with ten-year-olds and, and teach yeah, them yeah, how to invent yeah. and do science. Yeah. And if you tell a ten-year-old kid that the most energy-efficient way to get to school is on a roller coaster or a zip line, they're all over it, right? We have to create really positive visions of the future um, about how how good your life is. Mm. If we could really share all of the objects in our lives, so you can borrow my kayak, I can borrow Tom's mountain bike, Tom can borrow someone's uh, summer home so that we don't all have to replicate the ownership of all these things, we could have arguably access to a lot more of the things we want, and so we just need to build an economy around shared objects. And that, you know, with internet technologies, that should be possible. Two, two very quick ideas. That, uh, I, I had lunch with a guy by the name of Bob Rodale who eventually died in a traffic accident, which is sa sad, but he ran Rodale Press. And he said what we need, I, we were talking about markets, and I thought we were going to talk about organic markets and things like that. He said, no, a repair market, so we can have our things repaired. Right. So, and yeah, return to butcher, baker, and candlestick maker. I, yeah. write, a lot the, of, the I write a lot about this. And, and, and there are, you know, I've been to St. Petersburg. There are doing repair it more and more. markets in it's St. Becoming, Petersburg. Yeah. yeah. And another thing was, I was in... in uh, the Netherlands, and they have a kids' market. Uh, toy libraries, fantastic. Right, and it's just, they go and barter their, and trade toys. And it's just, you know, those little things all of a sudden can be turned into a... Yeah. What? Yeah, right. I mean, you just don't need to buy a fraction of what you do. So, and, and, you know, this is how we will rebuild the American economy. These are, these are new business ideas. They're fundamentally disruptive. You know, um, there's going to be a lot of people who don't like these ideas, right. but... I, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by them, and I think we should go there, but and part of it is, well, America's going to have to relearn how to make and repair stuff, and, and you, you're starting from scratch. I mean, I, I go through processes of trying to make stuff here or make it in Asia. I cannot make things economically here, and the quality is terrible. The, the bit has flipped. The quality of cast parts coming out of China is higher than it is here for large categories of products. So I think I think that's it. There's, I, I could I don't know if people want one last question, but yeah. Uh, absolutely, and this is my f I have a slide here, and it's, I, I'm sorry I'm not working from. I actually prepared slides to have a lot of these things here, but they lost got lost last night. But I have a slide. How do you price carbon correctly? And that's really the the carbon tax question, and I think it at one cent, uh, you know. Carbon's currently trading at $13 per ton in the European trading market. And I think that adds about 30 cents per gallon to the price of gas. And it's been largely ineffectual at behavioral change. So that's obviously too low. I would argue as a physicist, the right price for carbon 
should be how much it costs to take a free space molecule of CO2 and put it in a, a and make it into a solid like bamboo stalk or a piece of limestone or whatever it happens to be. And right now that would be about a thousand dollars a ton. Um, I think there's there's been some interesting studies. Maybe around four hundred dollars a ton for carbon, you actually would impact significantly air travel. Um, so the, 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 the carbon tax, yes, it would work, um, but the question is, what is the right price? So then we've said, let's let the, but my criticism of the carbon tax is that tax doesn't have the end goal in mind. I'm gonna give one defense for cap and trade. I'm not a fan of cap and trade, <laughs> but there is one logical thing about cap and trade that is very sensible. The word cap means there is a cap, there's an end goal. With a tax, there is no end goal, so you're just pricing it and you hope you get the end result. At least with a cap, you could say the end goal is 450 parts per million. There's no going over it. Um, and so I, I think I'm in favor of a tax because it's far more direct and you, and you can redistribute the tax dollars into the society in good ways and there's, there's a whole lot of good things about it. But we do need to frame the tax. The next question you need to ask about tax is how do you fixate on an end goal and what really is the w pricing mechanism for carbon, because the current way we price it is, is sort of broken. Yeah, might finish there. Thank you, everyone.